Hello Akuma fans, Charlie with the Gossiker Application staff. We're back for part three of AOT, or Advanced One Touch, the onboard Akuma program assist software. In part one, we configured all of our defaults, all of our desired parameters, so that the code that the software punches out is something that we expect. You know, did a little configuration on how we want the machine to behave. In part two, we created tools for this job. I do want to reiterate that the tools we created in part two are going to be in our library forever until somebody deletes them. So you don't have to go in and customize tools every job. Once I have my library populated in future jobs, I just say, hey, you remember that tool? We're going to use it. The only time that we have to go back in and add to or subtract from our library is, oh, hey, I bought a new tool or I found one that wasn't defined or I broke one. <laughs> Knock on wood. Yeah, I never break them, right? So here we are for part three. We're going to get the software ready to program. I'm using my PCNC Master, the simulator of the machine, mainly because I think that the majority of people that are going to be watching this video uh, just discovered that they've got the software on their, their machine and they want to know how to use it there. If you have AOT for the PC, it's exactly the same procedures, but accessing the programming is obviously going to be a little different. But let's focus on the machine itself. My first step when the machine powered up is, oh, and by the way, before I go out, you can do this while the machine is running. Oh, yeah, baby. So you don't have to sit there with a, a, an idle spindle while you program. Little side note for you. We're just going to reach up and touch our program information tab. This guy, program operation. And everybody's seen this before, I'm sure. This is where your NC code is stored. I have a couple of DXF files that are in here. Shh, you don't see those. We're going to use those in uh, step four of the video series. But normally this would be where all my NC code is. In the upper right hand corner, oh look at this. I've got a tab that I didn't pay any attention to before. NC program is the one that's highlighted by default, but right in it to the left of it is the IGF data tab. Oh yeah. Okay, so I like the way Akuma set up this structure. They have this folder designated for .min files or actual NC code, G code, but they have a separate folder, IGF, which is where we're gonna put our source code. This is the programming file itself. You will find out, maybe through accident, that uh, you can have your IGF data in the NC program folder, but that kind of stinks a little bit because then you got to dig through what is my PET or the source code file and which one is my NC code. And blah, 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 blah. If you're going to program and run in IGF mode, then it really doesn't matter which folder you put it in. But yeah, that's a whole nother subject that we're going to get to probably in about episode six or seven when we actually punch code. So first step, we're going to go to our IGF data tab and we're going to touch new file over F3. They want to know, are you going to create a directory, another folder where this individual part will be in? That's kind of neat if I'm going to have multiple programs for a single part. But let's concentrate on IGF data. As soon as I touch, yep, I want the, the source code. I'm going to create a source code file. It comes up with the default of a file name called a.pet. Well, that's, you know, default. And I'm going to customize this. I'm going to call this class, class.pet. And as soon as I say OK, it opens up the dialog block that is the focus of today's episode, this is how we are describing our basic primary setup for what we're about to do. We have some tabs up on the top of the screen, but we're going to get to those later because it needs some information first about exactly what we're, we're working with. First question is, what is the material that I'm playing with today? Now, these are all the defaults. You remember in episode one, we created a new one. But I don't see it up here. I have 
more than the more than what is this uh, six seven eight i have more than eight pieces of material so if i arrow over to the right there's the one i created in episode one and the one we're going to use today aluminum 6061 so now it has loaded the default feeds and speeds that i specified for this type of material the first option on shape is a round bar, and that's going to be 99.99% of the jobs that we do. Hey, this is a turning center. We usually start with either a slug or a piece of bar stock. The option number two is a free blank. And if I select that, it's going to give me the opportunity to describe a casting, something that's just an oddball shape. Not really useful all the time, but hey, it's there for you. And the next one is called an average blank. And if we take the average blank, it adds a few fields for us. Yeah, there it's showing us, you know, a described shape and we're going to be removing a specific amount. Not exactly something I would use every day. So we're gonna stick with the round bar. There it is, round bar. And super easy to describe. What is the outside diameter and the OAL? So this is my finished part and we're going to take a look at it and say, okay, my final dimension is going to be two and a half inch diameter and two and a half length. So I'm going to start with 2.75 inch diameter and let's do a 2.75 blank as well. There, it started to draw my system for me. It's showing me the blanks. Next question is, is this tube stock? Does it have an inside diameter? And I have a choice between saying, yes, this is a tube that has an ID going all the way through, or it's got a counterbore in the front. This comes into play down the road if we're doing something and we're counting on some material being removed for the machine to automatically decide where the start point is. But we're just using a slug for this job, so I'm gonna say there is no inside. Then we want to know where is the base surface. Now the European standard is to have it on the left side. They like having their datum all the way on the left where the blank is stuck in with the chuck. The American standard in general is to have it on the right end. I don't know why, I guess it's just the difference between, you know, cultures, whatever. So we're gonna go with the right end this time. And now it's asking me to specify a zero position 401. There it is. There's my compass rose telling me what, or specifying what they're asking me for. They wanna know where is my zero point from the end of the actual stock. Now here's a little Charlie input for you. This question does not affect my program in any way. Zero zilch nada, uh, it can, automatically decide to make extra passes with a facing cut, but in essence, the program that gets punched out is no different. So I could leave this at zero if I was in a hurry. However, I like to see in the graphic verification that we're gonna do in a future episode, I like to see material get removed off of the face. And if I leave this at zero, I'm not gonna see that. I'm gonna see a facing tool come down and make a cut and nothing really physically happens. So I'm gonna put a value in here. I'm gonna pay attention to which sign I need. So yeah, it looks like I gotta go in the negative direction from my material Z and let's put in something nice, big and drastic like minus 050. You notice that as soon as I did that and then beat the snot out of my keyboard, I'm sure you heard the clack, You'll notice that my material shifted forward, so it's actively updating my graphic in real time to show me uh, what's, uh, what preferences I just set. Next question, spindle maximum speed. Notice it came up as 2500. If you remember in episode one, one of the things that I changed in my preferences was my maximum spindle speed. Hey, the machine's capable of 4200, but I've installed an eight inch three jaw chuck on this thing. I don't wanna be doing no 4200 RPM, no. So I set my default at 2500. Now I have a chance to overwrite that if I need to. Like say for instance, I am only gonna be gripping by 
125 thousandths of, uh, of part. And yeah, 2500 might be a little fast for this. I don't want centrifugal force to pump it out. I can overwrite this either higher or lower right now. However, I like my 2500. Next question is subspindle, second spindle. If I leave this blank, the software will automatically say, okay, we're only doing a one spindle job. If you only have a one spindle machine, you won't even see this field here. But if I add any values to this uh, dimension zero position number two, it will automatically say, okay, Charlie wants to do some subspindle work and it will enable some programming fields in the future that you're gonna see in probably episode four. So let's go ahead and say we're gonna do this. Same rules apply. Where is this, where's the spindle dimension for the second spindle? Where is that relative to my first one? And as you recall from this guy, we're at two and a half inches long. So I will tell this guy that from my datum, the second spindle is at minus, oh, hello, click on it, minus 2.5. There we go. Now it's showing me, okay, now you have two datums, one for spindle one, one for spindle two, and your max spindle speed for the second spindle. Let's knock that down to 1875. We're going to say I only have a uh, six inch chuck over there and it's got little skinny quick change jaws and so I want to be a little more a little more polite to it and there is my max spindle speed of 1875 as soon as I acknowledge that and I whack the hell out of the keyboard like I just did again I could now click on the word okay and I would be done but I'm not quite finished yet I want to come back up here and do some definition for my work setup as soon as I click on the first spindle, it shows me the jaws. Well, that's not how I'm holding my part. So, uh, you know, it doesn't affect the outcome of the NC code, but when I'm turning this thing, I would like to know ahead of time whether or not I'm smacking jaws. So I'm gonna take some time here and I'm going to define the jaws that are in spindle number one. First question, are we OD or ID gripping? Yep, we're on the outside, that's cool. And now if you've ever set up the graphics for the, uh, the, the turning function, this'll look very familiar. They want me to just utilize dimensions to define my jaw shape. First question, L1 for the jaw size. I look down here and L1 is defined as my overall from the base of the jaw to the top of the jaw and mine are 1.75. I just use a scale. This doesn't have to be totally exact, but I like to get it close enough so that I can see whether or not, say, a turning tool is gonna whack my jaws. Next question, D1. What is the overall width of the jaw? This is gonna help me to uh, draw the graphic to see collision issues. Mine are 3.2. Two, five, three and a quarter long. Next question is what is the depth that I'm capturing this jaw? Uh, capturing the part. You knew what I meant, right? So my L2, I'm gripping a quarter of an inch. Now it wants to know what is my uh, leftover material from the face of the part, from the OD of the part, out to the outside of the uh, of the jaw. Now, something happened that I didn't uh, acknowledge. Let's take a second. You notice that the jaws disappeared. And if you rewind, you'll notice that it happened when I set my jaw size D1. I just gave some conflicting information. I said that the overall of my jaw was smaller than the gripping amount. Uh, does not compute. So what Akuma did is they said, okay, I can't draw that. <laughs> you know, there's negative space here. Let me allow you to continue on with what you're doing just in case you're gonna fix the problem. And son of a gun, we're gonna fix the problem. So my 3.75 that used to be there 
That's not the case anymore. We are at two and three quarter inches. Now, as soon as I did that, it redrew what we were talking about. Now that's starting to look correct. My chucking diameter, 2.75. It populated that automatically from my, uh, my material size. That's good. Number of jaws, yep, there are three of them. And the jaw width, right there, that guy. Is, how wide are these jaws? And one and three eighths, that's exactly right. Cool. Now let's go on to spindle two. We'll do the same thing. I take my scale out and I see that this is one and three quarters tall. And my D1 is 2.75 on that guy. I'm gripping by, uh, what am I gripping by? This is 375. And my D3, that's the amount that it's sticking out afterwards. Once again, my jaws disappeared, but this is 1.75 because I've got a big blind there. There we go. Width is still 1375. I don't have a center used for this. I'm working on a second spindle machine, so we're done. Now we have everything defined. And as you're gonna see in future videos, the object of the game is when you have filled all the information that you can on the current screen, we're gonna look for the word okay or next. And I look down here, I see okay. Awesome, bonk. And once I click on that, now the software is ready to go. We have our material in here, it's showing us our datums. We're all set to start programming, but we gotta stay tuned for that one. So thanks for watching today. And uh, I should be dropping episode four here pretty quick. We'll start programming. We'll bring in some trick geometry. We'll have some fun with it. So make sure you subscribe and turn on your notifications or whatever all that other stuff is that uh, we want to do so that you get notified as soon as the next episode drops. And we will see you guys out in the field. Yeah.